I'm Dr. Regina Kep. I'm a board certified clinical psychologist and I specialize with older adults and families. I created the Psychology of Aging podcast to dispel myths about aging, destigmatize mental health for older adults, and improve access to mental health care. Whether you're an older adult, a family member caring for an older adult, or a professional working with older adults, you're in the right place. And one more thing. If you're a licensed mental health provider like a social worker, psychologist, counselor, therapist, or an aging life care expert or certified care manager looking for continuing education focused on mental health and aging, simply go to mentalhealthandaging.com to learn more about how to earn your CEUs. All right, let's jump into today's episode. For better or for worse, most of us associate chronic pain with getting older. We assume that as we age, our bodies naturally break down and that pain is, quote, just a part of getting older. According to a report put out by CDC in 2016, close to 30% of adults in the U.S. experience chronic or high-impact chronic pain. And adults 65 and older make up the majority of people living with chronic pain. There are a lot of things that we can do, and we're going to talk about it today, to effectively manage chronic pain. And here's why it's so important. One, we don't want people living you know, with pain and suffering, but two, when people do experience chronic pain, their risk for depression goes up. And so today I'm delighted to bring to you an expert in the field of effective brief treatments for chronic pain. Let me introduce you to our guest today. Dr. Beth Darnall is Associate Professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative, and Pain Medicine, where she directs the Stanford Pain Relief Innovations Lab. Her team's pain treatment research is funded by the National Institutes of Health and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Dr. Darnall has twice briefed the U.S. Congress and the FDA on the need for patient-centered pain care and opioid stewardship. She is a scientific member of the NIH Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee and has served as a scientific member of the CDC Opioid Work Group. She's Chief Science Advisor for Applied VR and serves on the Board of Directors of the American Academy of Pain Medicine. Her work has been featured in outlets such as Scientific American, NPR Radio, BBC Radio, and Nature. She's authored five books for her patients and clinicians and is the creator of Empowered Relief, which is a single-session, evidence-based pain relief skills class that's available in 12 countries and in six languages. I am delighted to be interviewing Dr. Beth Darnall today. She's going to talk to us a lot about this Empowered Relief program and how you can be helpful to people living with chronic pain. Let's jump into today's interview. Thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your, your wisdom and knowledge about pain management and, and really accessible treatment models for pain management. Will you share a little bit about um, how you got interested in pain management and behavioral treatment for, for pain and chronic pain? Sure. No, I'm pleased to. I have a doctoral degree in clinical psychology, and when I was going through my um, program, clinical psychology program, there, there wasn't any education about chronic pain, pain management, how to help people living with this particular um, health burden. But interestingly, when I went on to my internship uh, at a VA hospital, everything was about pain management. I mean, veterans are older adults, and they have a lot of pain issues and medical comorbidities. And then from there, I did a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins University, where I was working with people with spinal cord injury, amputations, catastrophic burn, and major medical conditions. And while these are wildly disparate um, health conditions, there is one commonality. Pain management was crucial to each and, and every type of condition. It was really a foundational area in which I was working with patients. And I found that I, I really enjoyed being 
with people who were suffering and and helping them, uh, helping to alleviate their burden. Um, I it is just so gratifying to see people get better and do better. So I naturally gravitated towards this area. And I also share that I think one of the reasons why I've had great comfort with it is that I had chronic pain when I was younger myself. And so my own experience of chronic pain has definitely informed my understanding of both the patient experience, but, you know, patient needs and also the development of the treatments that I have designed. I so value yeah your your own personal journey and then your professional journey. Why do you think I mean there is such a disparity between what you learned in the classroom in graduate school and what happened in real life with the VA and Estrella was at the VA uh, healthcare system. I worked there for many many years and ten years at the Atlanta VA. And you're right, veterans are by and large older adults. One in two veterans is 65 and older, and. Um, and we have so many similarities, Beth. I also had a, had a, I worked in spinal cord injury for 10 years at the Atlanta VA. Wow. And yeah, we have so many overlaps. I know before this, we were talking about um, our overlap at, at Stanford, but why do you suppose there is that um, disconnect or was that disconnect in graduate school and then in real applied practice? I, I think there has been a, a conceptual bifurcation between mind and body and that, you know, pain has always been perceived as a physical and medical condition, a biomedical phenomenon. And for that reason, there has been far less emphasis on evaluating and treating pain uh, with an integrated approach. And this uh, has been a, a true disservice to both clinicians and patients because it has left patients untreated from a fully comprehensive integrated approach. They, they have not had good access. And similarly, clinicians have often felt um, under-resourced, under-educated, um, really uh, unskilled to, to address pain in their patient population. We conducted a study on this topic in 2016, and we surveyed almost a thousand patients in the United States and a thousand healthcare clinicians about the needs for pain education, access to psychological approaches um, to the management of chronic pain. And what we observed among psychologists is that the majority said that they felt that they were lacking um, education, skills, knowledge about how to appropriately address pain in their patient population. And Regina, we're not even talking about, you know, making people pain psychology experts, but Let's be real. If you're a clinician working with patients in any capacity, you're you're treating people who have pain. And so each and every patient encounter that all of us have is an opportunity to bring awareness and, and some level of education and resources to our patient population. But what we were hearing from clinicians is that they, they, they were saying that they lacked the competency, that it wasn't included in their um, programs, and it hasn't been well integrated into continuing education or licensure requirements. Now, a lot of this has been changing with a greater focus on pain management and a a huge focus on treating pain non-pharmacologically. Um, So there's been a big push now and a greater understanding that pain is not just a biomedical condition or phenomenon. The International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain as both a noxious sensory and emotional experience. And so psychology is actually baked into the definition of pain, but that is not widely appreciated. But this is, you know, this is our opportunity to to better appreciate that Pain is a whole person experience that requires a whole person approach, because if we only treat the biomedical aspects of pain, if we only treat half 
of anything. How can we be surprised when the results are suboptimal? And and this is what we see to a very large extent. And when this second half of the definition definition that involves psychologists, social workers, behavioral health professionals, this is really exciting because this is where we can empower individuals to know what they can do on a daily basis to best help themselves so that they're making the right choices um, every day because some of the best choices for pain management uh, aren't intuitive. Um, Left to our own devices, it's natural for us to be making choices that are not actually helping us manage our pain. calling all mental health providers. Have you been feeling ineffective, stuck, or unsure of how to best help your client with memory loss? Well, it's not your fault. Most therapists haven't had any training in addressing memory loss or cognitive changes in therapy. But I got something for you. In my free 10-minute video where I walk you through five steps for helping your clients presenting with memory loss, you'll learn the difference between memory loss and mental health concerns for older adults and how to help. Get this free training and a bonus workbook that you can start using in your clinic today. Simply go to www.mentalhealthandaging.com forward slash clarity to learn more. That's www.mentalhealthandaging.com forward slash clarity, C-L-A-R-I-T-Y. Oh, yeah, the withdraw, the um, sort of sedentary, not wanting to move for fear of agitating. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Great example. Great yeah. example. So, um, Beth, you mentioned in that 2016 study, you surveyed 1,000 patients and 1,000 healthcare clinicians or, or health cl- mental health clinicians. What did the patients say? Yeah, so the patients told us a lot of people did not know about pain psychology or the role of psychology in the treatment of pain. So one of the things we learned is that we just need to better educate the public about the whole person pain Mm -hmm. experience and the role of psychology. And, but many people did know about it. And, and what they said was that there, there are many barriers to accessing behavioral health for pain management. And some of those include um, just not knowing where to find a skilled or, or a trained provider. So, you know, Regina, you know that um, you know, there's, there's a difference between just finding a psychologist or a therapist in the community versus a, a clinician who's really expert or specializes in, in pain management and some of these deeper issues. And, you know, there, there are few of these trained professionals and, And then even when there are, even when we have some local trained professionals, patients don't know how to find them. The clinicians, the doctors, other clinicians don't know how, who to refer to, how to refer to them. So there is a a broad lack of understanding about how to find these few professionals. But even when people are able to find these professionals, what we see is that the, the need vastly outweighs the availability. So these are highly sought after clinicians because of their specialized skill set. Um, there can be six months of a wait list. There's insurance barriers. A lot of people live outside of urban areas, and these specialized clinicians are often um, absent in these broader communities in the United States where the vast majority of patients reside. Um, So those are just some of those, some of the key issues. You know, there's travel burdens, there's copay issues. And then one last point that I'd like to mention is that often with behavioral health, 
um, we have an evaluation, and then we have treatment that often involves multiple follow-up treatment sessions, and that can be 8, 10, 12, or more sessions. So we're not just talking about the burden of finding a provider and getting the evaluation, but each and every follow-up session imparts additional burden on a patient population that often has mobility challenges, um, financial restrictions, um, all, all types of issues uh, with, with travel. And um, so really trying to access these multi-session treatments can impart a substantial burden on our patients who are often the most vulnerable and have the, the greatest health burdens on them already. That is in, uh, incredibly important to talk about. So not only is pain itself the barrier, there are all of these systemic barriers like financial restrictions, and it's hard to work full time if you're in chronic pain or living with disabling pain. It's uh, you might be using your money for multiple types of treatment and then not have money elsewhere or just to basically pay the bills. And we know that people living with disabilities, you know, tend to have more socioeconomic challenges and the, then that insurance and those barriers and, and trying to find a provider, where do you even look and how do you even vet them? Yeah. I want to back up, you know, you were talking something so important that you said pain is a whole, uh, pain affects the whole person and it deserves a whole person approach. And for so long, we were only looking at the biomedical sort of model and not including a more holistic biomedical, psychosocial, spiritual approach. And I want to just um, talk for a minute about um, the downfall of only looking at the uh, treating pain from a biomedical approach. And, and I really appreciate what you said that if we only treat part or from one perspective, which is the biomedical perspective, we're, we're going to fall short of full success mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's only going to treat part of the problem. Right. And so I want to just talk for a minute about the downfall of only treating a part, which is that biomedical part. And what's coming to my mind is how much of that approach then just sort of fueled the opioid crisis. And that then if it's only that approach, then we have that kind of treatment, which is a medical treatment. And, and I'm curious what, I'm not a pain specialist, but since you are, I'm curious what your thoughts are about that, the, the downfall of only treating part. Yeah, well, it's it's a really great point. And, you know, as I mentioned, if we only treat half of anything, we're going to fall short. And we have really fallen short when it comes to pain management. We have overemphasized the biomedical um, to, to the almost to the exclusion of the whole person behavioral health. And and I, I really want to mention that um, I speak with so many physicians and prescribing providers, and they are on board with behavioral health. What they have lacked is accessible options to refer their patients. So what we're seeing are these environmental contingencies that have maintained a biomedical approach. We do not have great reimbursement models. Um, we do not have enough trained providers. And so, of course, your average primary care physician in rural America is going to see Mrs. Smith, um, who's 75 with limited mobility, and, and this physician does not have good options for her. And so Mrs. Smith is more likely to get prescriptions. She's more likely to get interventions, injections, pain procedures, these types of, you know, uh, treatment approaches that may be indicated. But what we know is that those are riskier options for pain management. And, and one of the core philosophies 
that we want to bring forward is to apply the lowest risk treatments first, always. So for instance, the Lancet um, convened an expert consensus panel uh, and, and review scientific review and, and consensus panel. And they concluded based on the evidence that pain education and cognitive behavioral therapy should be first line treatments for chronic low back pain. So this, this uh, consensus panel was specific to chronic low back pain, which is the number one pain chronic pain condition worldwide, regardless of the country. And so CBT and pain education were recommended as first line treatments for chronic low back pain. And let's be real, we all know that that's not happening. And and so at the end of the day, we can we can we can talk all day long about what the evidence is and what's best practices, but until we make this accessible, meaningfully accessible to clinicians and to patients, the prescribers, physicians, and clinicians are going to default to whatever is available to them. And historically, that has been medications, procedures, things that people can get in-house and on demand. And the reason why this is problematic is that let's say Mrs. Smith you know, I mentioned she she has chronic pain, she has mobility issues, she's not very active because her pain is preventing her from engaging in her daily activities. And so she goes to a doctor for pain and the doctor may just prescribe a, a type of pain medication and, and they may prescribe um, uh, some certain types of procedures such as injections that she starts receiving regularly. Um, but what's absent from this approach is really understanding who Mrs. Smith is and, and what are her barriers and how can we best help her. So we don't just want to treat the pain. We want to treat the person who has pain. When we look at Mrs. Smith from a whole person perspective, we see that she has um, she does not understand all of these elements around pain and how to best treat it. She does not uh, understand. She, nobody has provided her with the information that it's, it's actually best for her and her type of pain to move more, to, to engage in movement on a regular basis. But because she hasn't had that information, she has become deconditioned, she's sedentary. This is now contributing to new onset pain, which has in, is interfering with her sleep. So she now has insomnia, which is one of the, the most the biggest predictors for increasing daytime pain. So her insomnia is now contributing to worsening pain during the day, which may be um, adding, to her um, impetus to take more medication during the day. She is becoming increasingly anxious and distressed with uh, her deterioration in her condition. She's worrying more about what's gonna happen if her pain continues to get worse. Um, she's feeling helpless about her pain, and she now has some symptoms of depression, feeling isolated because she's not able to get out and engage with her friends and her family as she used to. She's not seeing her grandchildren. So all of these meaningful connections and pleasurable activities are falling to the wayside. And what is increasing in size is her focus on pain. And so her, her life is now focusing on her pain, um, the restrictions, and going to these medical appointments. And this is highly problematic because what Mrs. Smith really needs is a whole person approach where we're looking at her from the whole person perspective. We are engaging her with a physical therapy evaluation so that she knows what's the safe and appropriate movement for her type of pain. And then we need the psychological or behavioral health approach so that we can help her feel and be less anxious as she engages in these day in this daily movement so that she can better manage 
the distress that may naturally arise when she thinks about engaging in activity or when she worries about the possibility of her pain worsening. So we need to equip Mrs. Smith with a foundational skill set so that she can understand how to calm her nervous system and be able to steer herself away from these types of behaviors and thoughts that we know amplify pain. And instead, we're steering her more towards a rehabilitation or engagement in meaningful activities while being able to self-soothe so that she can get a better night's rest. Now, I want to be really careful. These are not binary. It's not all medical and it's not all behavioral health. She may need those medications and she may need some of those pain procedures. But if we integrate in a behavioral health approach, especially early on in the process, we can help Mrs. Smith have a better response to the medical treatments that her doctors will try. And in many cases, we can obviate some of those medical uh, treatments because pain is just simply better managed at the outset. Similar to the Lancet recommendations, if we apply education, cognitive behavioral therapy, these skills-based self-management approaches early on, we can help a substantial fraction of patients learn to engage in the right actions early on with a goal of obviating some of the more invasive or riskier treatments for some patients. Mm. As you were talking, I, I started to reflect on my own patients. This example of Mrs. Smith is so helpful because it, um, for those of us who, who work with folks with a lot of pain, one of the things I hear from my patients is I'm tired of being a patient. I'm always a patient. I don't have any other role in my life now, but being a patient, like you were describing Mrs. Smith's world narrowing into being very pain oriented. Mm -hmm. And back to that, as you were talking, I was thinking about this and applying it to my own clinical population and thinking, oh, right. So if we only focus and that, that to me is one of the fallouts of the biomedical only approach mm -hmm. is that then the, the, the complementary relationship is that, or the relationship of the patient to the biomedical approach is that they're a patient and that it disempowers them and their whole self. Right. And so as you were talking, I was thinking, oh yes. Yeah, so this approach that you're talking about and Lancet said is the first line with education and cognitive behavioral therapy invites a more holistic frame for the person so that they can bring all of themselves and not just their pained living in pain self. And I really appreciate that because I hear so often with this biomedical approach, and this is for pain, this is for cancer, this is for dementia, this is for all sorts of um, conditions. I hear I'm so tired of being a patient. And I think the patient role gets reinforced if we're only looking at biomedical. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. 100%. And so I, I so appreciate this. And I, and I also hear that only looking at biomedical really disempowers the person because it puts them in the role only of patient. And if we look at the holistic frame of the person that empowers them. And I think this is a helpful, maybe segue to your program. So I know you've been very passionate and focused on creating some of that um, what can we do that's low risk and high impact for, for um, uh, helping reduce pain and provide education? And what do you think, Beth? Is this a good place to talk about what you're creating or what you've created? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Regina. Well, you know, I've been working with patients with chronic pain for, you know, 15 years. And what I would see in the clinic is that, um, you know, I, I, I would evaluate patients once, but in so many cases, the recommended form of treatment was inaccessible to them. I could say, well, you know, you, you would really benefit from learning this information about self-management 
um, or these cognitive behavioral skills, you know, pain management skills would benefit you greatly. You could apply these in your daily life and begin steering yourself towards recovery, um, towards engaging in, in meaningful activities and having less distress. But Regardless of what I would recommend, um, this was not feasible for the majority of people who didn't have access to it. So what recognizing this and, and this vast need to connect people to this information, I essentially took um, the skills based evidence based ingredients from multiple different treatments uh, that exist today, cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain, um, self-management principles, pain neuroscience education, and mindfulness principles. And I, I took these um, key ingredients and compressed them into a single session uh, intervention called Empowered Relief. And the reason I did this is what I observed is that while I couldn't see most people for multiple sessions, I could see most people for one session. They could attend one treatment session. And so it was really born from the great need for um, accessible um, accessible ways for people to acquire this, these critical skills. So Empowered Relief is a two-hour skills-based class that is broadly applicable to anybody living with pain. It could be acute pain or even chronic pain, but I first developed the intervention for people with chronic pain. And over the course of two hours, people learn all of that, all about pain, what it is, um, how it can be best managed by integrating in these behavioral medicine approaches and skills. People learn three core skills which facilitate self-regulation of pain, of the distress that and stress that pain naturally causes us. So people learn about how stress and, and pain impact the central nervous system. And then they learn these core skills to best control um, these factors so that they are steering themselves towards relief and towards having greater control over their experience so that they're not just relying on the doctor and on these medical treatments, which are, you know, can be vitally important. But if, if we, if we don't know what we can do to help ourselves, then we're missing a key opportunity. So empowered relief is all about equipping individuals with effective pain management skills that they can use on a daily basis to best control their own experience and steer themselves towards relief. And this occurs over a single session to our class. Uh, people leave the class having tailored the information to themselves. They leave with a completed personalized plan for empowered relief. So as you know, information is only useful to the extent to which we apply it to ourselves on a daily basis. So we move people from just education to applying it to themselves. And we really set themselves, we really set people up with the understanding of what they can do each day. Um, people leave the class with a 20-minute binaural audio file. So they also have a standardized tool that they can use on a daily basis to, uh, to calm their nervous system. This is a guided, deep relaxation um, audio file that has been tested in multiple randomized controlled trials now. Um, and it facilitates uh, basically this uh, encoding of the relaxation um, response. So the nice thing is people can receive empowered relief online. So with online delivery of Empowered Relief now, um, we can access uh, all these patients who live in rural areas. People, you know, we can transcend many of these pre-existing barriers that have prevented um, people from receiving effective behavioral health for chronic pain. 
So it's a, a two hour class that you, you have built the curriculum based on evidence. And I think you've, uh, you're a researcher and, and I know you have, um, you know, done a lot of research with various organizations in, in IMH. Am I, am I remembering that right? So in CCIH, yeah, with the National Institutes of Health, um, so it's a national center for complementary and integrative health funded our primary research. So this was a $4 million grant that we received in 2015 to study the comparative efficacy of two hour empowered relief compared to 16 hours of standardized cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain, both skills-based um, treatments, but obviously one much briefer than the other. And we just, uh, we finished this randomized controlled trial uh, this year and just published our results in JAMA Network Open in August. And I have to tell you, this was a really rigorous trial. We studied uh, this in chronic, in community-based individuals with chronic low back pain. So this was a specific pain condition. Um, but we aimed to understand whether a two, whether a two-hour empowered relief would be comparably effective to sixteen hours of CBT three months after completion of the treatments. And we were very pleased to have our hypothesis met. We, we showed and, and published in JAMA Network Open that indeed two-hour empowered relief was comparably effective to eight sessions CBT for reducing pain catastrophizing, pain intensity, pain interference, and a whole host of other secondary outcomes, such as sleep disturbance, fatigue, depression, anxiety, pain bothersomeness, and all of this three months later. And while we have not yet published these data, we are showing durability of effects for uh, comparable efficacy of the two-hour class six months after receipt of treatment. This is... Um, really a breakthrough in understanding that brief treatment can be um, effect as effective as longer course treatment, with at least empowered relief. This is the only treatment we have studied, but we're so excited about it because what it suggests is that we have an evidence-based pathway that could truly broaden access um, to behavioral health for chronic pain. Now, this NIH study, we can I mentioned that we conducted that in chronic low back pain, um, but about half of the sample had multiple pain conditions. And we also conducted a second randomized controlled trial in mixed etiology chronic pain meaning people with any type of pain condition. And we studied online delivery of empowered relief. And we found similar multidimensional benefits for empowered relief three months after people received the single session class online. And um, so again, we have uh, several data points now suggesting that the class is broadly uh, effect uh, um, it has broad efficacy, but what we haven't yet shown is effectiveness of empowered relief. And so, to prove effectiveness, you need to study the treatment really broadly in the wild in community-based settings. And I'm really excited to share, Regina, that um, just this month we received major funding from the patient. Centered Outcomes Research Institute. This is PCORI. They awarded us a $10.3 million research award to conduct a national comparative effectiveness study of online empowered relief compared to online eight session CBT. And what's especially exciting about this is that we, it's a six site national study um, and we are enriching our sample for um, people who live in rural areas, who are um, black, 
African American who are on Medicare and Medicaid, older adults and and really underserved populations. So we're taking this way outside of Stanford, way outside of research environments, and we are going to conduct the effectiveness science nationally to be able to, to give clinicians and payers and patients broadly the information they need to make informed decision-making about which treatment is best for them. Congratulations on that big new grant. I think that's so incredibly important, especially with all of the uh, health disparities that we know exist for underserved ethnic minority populations like Black African-American populations, Latinx populations, older adults are underserved yes. population. So I, I'm just congratulations and, and thank you for doing this in, in a applying your work more broadly and integrating it more into the community. Now, ha have you looked at all at um, pairing the, the benefits or the effects of pairing uh, empowered relief with CBT? No, we, we have not looked at sort of uh, stacking it. The, yeah. the way that I sort of envision this, and, and I have some data to speak to this, is it empowered relief is a fantastic first session people learn why the why behavioral health is important they learn these core skills what we find for a lot of people who take empowered relief is that they ask for more afterwards they say how do i get you know can i can i take another class is there more that i can learn and so it's almost like that that uh first entry into, um, into more extensive treatment. So a, a lot of, so we have to date, um, empowered relief is in healthcare organizations throughout the United States. We've certified about 350 clinicians and they're delivering empowered relief broadly. It is being delivered in 12 countries. It's available in six languages. So it's, it's all over and we hear from people that, um, that it enhances patients' re receptivity to further engagement in behavioral health. I think one of the things that we have is a bit of a, a, a crisis or a problem of branding. Um, one of the issues with branding is even the word psychological. So to medical people who are going to their doctor for medical treatments, to be referred to a psychologist, people don't understand that. And they'll say, but my pain isn't psychological. Why are you sending me to a psychologist? Um, and then next, the term cognitive behavioral therapy. People will say, well, why do I need therapy? I have a medical problem. So the terminology has really itself has has contributed to some stigma, some misunderstandings, and it has served as a barrier to patient access to behavioral health. Whereas empowered relief as a class is designed to be less stigmatizing, accessible. The family can attend. You can attend anonymously. You do not even have to say your name. You don't have to talk about your history. It is not therapy. And once we get people in the door and they learn more about all of these other pieces, they become uh, more interested in, in engaging further. So what we have seen is that some people naturally will take empowered relief and then want to go on to CBT, but we have not conducted a, a study as such, although I am aware of other researchers who are um, currently studying what, you know, this exact, you know, the question that you're asking, like, have you looked at empowered relief and then CBT? Um, so so there are people who are doing that. Oh, great. Earlier, you also mentioned that one of the goals uh, with Empowered Relief is to reduce some of the medical, uh, more invasive medical interventions. Am I recalling that correctly? So we, be we, we believe, and the data suggests, we haven't studied this directly. We're going to, we will get the data in this new large PCORI funded effectiveness study. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to collect direct data to be able to say whether empowered relief, online empowered relief and online um, CBT reduce 
health care utilization long term. Um, so what we have now are, are more, uh, you know, data points from prior work that have shown that if we effectively address um, some individual factors in patients, then they have a better response to medical treatments and they require less medical intervention. So um, we've seen that in prior work, but we have not directly studied it for empowered relief proper. Yeah, and, and you mentioned um, you're with the new study going to be applying it to more underserved populations. Has empowered relief been studied with older adults or, or is there data that gives yeah. us information about older adults or who empowered relief is more beneficial for? Or is it what do you notice? You know, great questions. And we have conducted multiple randomized controlled trials, and we have found no baseline predictors for treatment response. And what I mean by that is there's, you know, it's it's not just for higher education or lower education or one type of pain versus another to date. Um, our information suggests that this is broadly applicable to all individuals. We have um, not restricted to older adults or younger adults. We have looked at the data um, for older adults, and there, there was one element that, that was um, both interesting and surprising to me is that the highest treatment satisfaction ratings come from older adults. Um, so, so they really like the information. They're very pleased with being given access to this treatment pathway. Um, it, Humana Neighborhood, I don't know if you're familiar with Humana Neighborhood, but this is an offshoot of Humana, the, the national payer, and Humana Neighborhood services Medicare and Medicaid patients, and they deliver online education to this patient population. And they uh, integrated Empowered Relief into their member portfolio. So in October of 2021, I delivered several uh, online classes to the Humana Neighborhood membership nationally. And so virtually everyone is an older adult and it was um, really well received and Humana is now um, expanding um, Empowered Relief in their treatment portfolio to members. They're certifying uh, many different clinicians within their system to be able to scale out Empowered Relief, and they are also one of the sites for this new PCORI multi-site uh, research award um, that we're starting in 2022. So we are hoping to really expand access to older adults. Also, the Phoenix VA is one of our study sites, and that's predominantly older adults and um, we are hoping to receive some preferred designation to be able to um, put forward empowered relief as an as an evidence based treatment for specifically for older adults because there is such a huge need. I mean, as you know, about three quarters of um, older adults report living with persistent pain, three quarters, and a, a majority describe having pain that's moderate or, or severe. And so we really and truly need to provide accessible behavioral health options to this patient population to help decrease their suffering and, and increase their quality of life. Yes. And decrease risk with so many medications because sure. medication interactions are one of the biggest risks for older Absolutely. adults. If you're on heavy duty pain meds, that's pretty, pretty tough, especially with the impact on cognitive functioning. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. And congratulations. Oh, I just am so delighted to hear about this multi-site study and your, your, the results of um, satisfaction coming from older adults has been by and large, my experience as a, as a geropsychologist that my, um, I have such 
wonderful experiences working with older adults. And I think that is one of, in terms of their satisfaction, my satisfaction as a clinician, their satisfaction in receiving the care and that it's available to them. I think there's a lot of gratitude that I really appreciate. Um, I also wanted to say that like one of the, one of the things I see in healthcare systems is, is that because I, I wonder if, if it's because I think there's ageism is a part of this, but if about 75% of older adults experience some level of persistent pain, it's um, providers might hear about it commonly. And because it might be a common concern, I wonder if it gets minimized yeah. and then doesn't get the treatment options it deserves. And I really just so appreciate that there's something that now with empowered relief that um, providers can use and can provide. And I think by and large health providers and pain health, uh, pain medical providers, um, want to be helpful, you know, want to alleviate suffering and want to address the pain and, um, and want something to offer. And I think since the focus for so long has been my biomedical medications and interventions have been one. And what you're saying is that actually we can do more. We can include the whole person with programs like empowered relief and cognitive behavioral therapy. I think there's some act for chronic pain that also has evidence and, and that actually we can do more. And now we're giving more um, resources for health professionals to offer in the moment. And I, so and that's, that's accessible to the patient with just a two hour course. I so appreciate that and that it can help reduce also the stigma for older adults in talking about chronic pain. It can increase awareness of a medical provider on, even though it's common, it doesn't mean it's any less important for older adults to get pain managed. And, and now there are tools for older adults for doing that. So it's just great. Now I'm, I'm, I need to step down from my soapbox because I'm a pretty anti-ageist anti, and then also there's an ableism component yeah. too, because yeah. we conflate age with ability quite often. You know, and, and all great points, Regina. And I just want to add one additional point, um, which is that the person, people, older adults tend to minimize their own pain and especially older populations where it's like, well, this is just part of aging and this is just the way it is. And they were raised with such an, you know, a, a, an ethic to suck it up and you don't go to the doctor. So as clinicians, we have the opportunity to check in with our clientele and really understand what they're experiencing, how they're feeling, and then give them access to low risk, low cost, low burden, skills-based treatment that has shown to reduce pain intensity, reduce pain interference, reduce the burden of multidimensional symptoms, help them sleep better, help them live better. Um, so that that's another part of it, because I agree with you that because pain is so common, it just, you know, it gets minimized in everyone's mind. Um, but sometimes the patients won't even bring it forward to discuss. And so there's truly needless suffering and, and living with pain. And if we can help reduce that burden for our clientele, that's just, um, that it, it's really something tremendous that we can offer them. And then, as you said, and, and also ourselves, because helping our, our patients, our clientele, seeing them get better is, and live better is, it's why we do what we do. And, and that is the gratification of being a clinician, truly. Yes. And to your point, um, older adults have had a lifetime of internalizing ageism, you know, like what's expected as we age. And, uh, and I, and I, you were pointing to that exactly that, that ageism gets internalized that of course I'm experiencing pain. I'm old. And, and then they get reinforcements of that message, in society and sometimes by their own providers, by their family members, by movies and media. And, and actually what you're saying is we have to help dispel that myth that pain is manageable. We can help you better manage it and improve your quality of life and alleviate some of that suffering. Yeah. And you deserve it too. Absolutely. I I'm so curious about your certification. So, and how this actually does get applied. So how do um, 
who can get certified and how does one apply it in practice? Like, is this certified at a medical provider level at a mental health provider level? What, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. We offer a clinician certification uh, through Stanford University CME. And any type of clinician, health clinician can become a certified empowered relief instructor. So we certify physical therapists, physicians, nurses, psychologists, mental health therapists, you name it. Um, but this is, we certify clinicians to deliver the empowered relief intervention to patients or clientele. The certification process involves um, participating in a two-day uh, online certification workshop that involves about 11 hours of uh, contact time or face-to-face -face learning. Um, and so we offer those certification workshops every couple of months at Stanford. So we have an Empowered Relief website. You can go to the website, see what our training schedule looks like. <clears throat> but once clinicians are certified, they receive all of the information needed to immediately begin implementing Empowered Relief with patients. So I mean, you can start the very next day if you wish. Um, we do recommend that people kind of build up in, in being an instructor because, you know, I have because Empowered Relief is a class, you're not limited to traditional sizes. Um, so the largest group uh, patients, group of patients that I have treated has been uh, 85 patients at once. Um, when we deliver online classes, you can have, a, you know, you could have hundreds of people in a single class. So it's really up to you. But uh, certified instructors receive all of the instructor materials and all of the patient facing in, uh, materials. So there is an, a standardized instructor PowerPoint slide deck. So the information is delivered um, via a slide deck that is uh, very highly structured. There's an instructor manual, and then there are the patient facing materials, including the personalized plan for empowered relief, the binaural audio file. You get everything that you need to begin implementing um, the class right away. There are no ongoing licensing fees. There are no additional fees ever. Um, you have access to all of the language translations, um, etc. We There is a fee for becoming uh, certified. So for that 11 hours, the two-day certification workshop, um, we do offer continuing education for that based on your discipline. So you'll have to visit our website to see um, that we offer, if you're a psychologist, we offer APA, CEs, there's, um, you know, various disciplines have various um, continuing education credit for it. So it's just the one-time education fee. And then ongoingly, there's no, there's no additional fees um, for Empowered Relief ever. And people can use it. To, so from what you're saying, people can use it in their private practice. People can use it in their hospital-based system. People could use it in their, wherever they'd like after they get certified. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. And for live online delivery and also in-person delivery, um, we do have a terms of use. And there is there is one restriction where let's say if somebody wanted to deliver it uh, online inside of some other national program, like a coaching program or something like that, you do have to um, receive approval through Stanford University for that type of very broad um, dissemination. But for uh, local clinicians uh, within, your, within your clinic, within your healthcare organization, there uh, are no restrictions on, on delivery. We, we want Empowered Relief to be accessible to clinicians, healthcare organizations, and patients. Do people bill for this? Some do. They, they do. And we offer a, um, through the certification workshop, we offer example billing that may, people may choose to use. 
Um, we do not restrict billing. We have, you know, we empowered relief. We we only certify and we don't um, we don't restrict whether people charge or not, whether they bill insurance or not. So people have utilized different models. So at Stanford, if you are a patient in the Stanford Pain Management Clinic you have access to Empowered Relief for free. We offer it on a rolling basis and people can attend that class for free. Other clinicians charge a flat rate for patients to join. They offer national online classes and let's say for $20, patients can go on. It's about the same as a copay. They go on, they register and, and they and their family can attend the class online. Other clinicians choose to bill insurance. And so they're, they're, you know, treating their patients at the local level and, and going through the billing process. So it's, it's variable. And again, we, we do not uh, restrict what, how people choose to, um, to, to bill or not. What's been the um, reception from people or who are using empowered relief in their clinics and practices? We have received tremendous feedback, um, you know, pain, I'm just thinking of one pain clinic in Canada in particular, they, I love what they're doing. This is, this is the way I believe it should be done is that um, everybody should have access to empowered relief on day one. So as soon as you join a clinic, um, you, you report having pain you're invited to the next empowered relief class where you can learn about you know all of this information and so that further destigmatizes it because everybody is encouraged to attend we're not singling people out based on uh, any type of a profile um, but there what they tell us is representative of what we're hearing from others that Patients are just so grateful for the information. They love the participatory um, focus and learning what they can do to help themselves. And they come away with actionable information um, that nobody else has presented to them. So um, they say that patients both um, really appreciate the class and are benefiting from the class, which you know is really critical. So it dovetails with what we see in our research as well. So the the, the community, sort of the pragmatic implementation. And the feedback that we're receiving from that um, matches what we have seen in the research settings as well. I pro provide psychotherapy. That's kind of what I do. Uh, that's my clinical practice is with psychotherapy. And I so often will think, oh, I wish I had time to just give the person a class or I wish it would, like, I just want to impart some basic information that everybody comes to psychotherapy with. Yeah. And, and it seems like that's what empowered relief does is it, it, it kind of lays the foundation of, um, pain management and treatment and using the, uh, I believe you said there were three, there was the neuroscience mindfulness and, um, CBT for chronic pain principles to, yes. to develop your empowered, uh, relief program. Um, and I, I just think it to your, you had mentioned that your wish or how you envision it is that it's um, used in conjunction with as a sort of conjunction uh, with long term or cognitive behavioral therapy or other evidence based therapies. Are there other evidence based therapies for chronic pain outside of CBT and um, what you're doing with empowered relief? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, in 2018, um, I published a book on this topic through uh, American uh, Psychological Association Press. It's called Psychological Treatments for Patients with Chronic Pain. And I overview in, in that text all of the evidence-based treatments. So we've touched on several of them today. There is um, self-management that can be peer-led or expert-led. We've talked about um, multi-session structured cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain, um, ACT-based treatments for chronic pain, ACT, of course, being a variant of cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based skills um, 
uh, treatment is uh, also evidence-based, really nice evidence there. And then there are various um, techniques such as hypnosis or biofeedback, um, all of these treatments typically requiring multiple sessions and working with a, a trained uh, therapist or a clinician. Uh, but I, I review sort of the broader scope of evidence-based treatments for chronic pain in that text. Oh, great. Thank you. I just want to also give a disclaimer. I have no affiliation with Empowered Pain and, um, and so it, uh, and neither does the Center for Mental Health and Aging, but I'm just delighted to hear of a program that has evidence based that's a, a sort of classroom accessible option for people living with pain. And some clinics are offering it for free, like Stanford. Some, um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes of the Phoenix VA um, part of your study because so many programs um, get rolled out at the VA. And so we'll, you know, for some mental health and behavioral health programs, um, when the VA approves them, you know, lots of people within the VA yeah. system can get trained. And I hope since this has evidence and it's so accessible that, that, that happens for you all. Thank you. Thank you. And especially for a, a veteran population that has high need and uh, is 50% older adults. Um, well, I want to just thank you so much, Dr. Darnell, for your time and your expertise and your willingness to just come here and, and share all of this um, with us. Where can people learn more about Empowered Relief and you? Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, Empowered Relief, you can uh, visit our website. This is for, this is the clinician certification uh, website. So you can learn about the workshops if you're interested. And that's at empoweredrelief.stanford.edu. We're pretty easy to find uh, online. Um, and I'm also pretty easy to find online. I, I do welcome uh, questions from people. So you can ask, you can find me at uh, bethdarnell.com and there is a contact Beth field there that um, comes to me. So if you have questions about anything that we talked about today or anything else about chronic pain in older adults, um, I definitely welcome the, uh, the contact. Thank you. One last question. Any harm or downside with Empowered Relief? Not that we know of. We have conducted multiple randomized controlled trials and we do not have any adverse events recorded, um, nor have I heard of any adverse events with the clinical implementation. Tens of thousands of patients have been uh, have received empowered relief now, um, again, from about 350 certified instructors. And I've been delivering the intervention for um, about close to 10 years now without any uh, without us recording any adverse events. Well, congratulations. And thank you so much again for being here and sharing this wisdom and research with us. So for Empowered Relief, the links that you shared, your, your APA book, and some of the references that you cited, we'll link to those in the show notes as well. Terrific. Thank you. Well, it's really been uh, delightful and uh, I've really enjoyed sharing my work with, with you and, and your audience. So thank you for the opportunity. That's all for today. Just a reminder, if you're a licensed mental health provider looking for continuing education focused on mental health and aging, simply go to mentalhealthandaging.com to learn more about how to earn your CEUs. Calling all mental health providers. Have you been feeling ineffective, stuck, or unsure of how to best help your client with memory loss? Well, it's not your fault. Most therapists haven't had any training in addressing memory loss or cognitive changes in therapy but I got something for you in my free 10 minute video where I walk you through five steps for helping your clients presenting with memory loss. You'll learn the difference between memory loss and mental health concerns for older adults and how to help get this free training and a bonus workbook that you can start using in your clinic today. Simply go to www.mentalhealthandaging.com forward slash clarity to learn more. 
That's www.mentalhealthandaging.com forward slash clarity, C-L-A-R-I-T-Y.